Sina naman magsaysay, Ferdinand Marcos at Rodrigo Duterte. Samayon ba kayo na silang tatlong pinakamahusay na presidente ng Pilipinas? Marami ang nagsasabi na sila nga ang mga natatanging presidente ng Pilipinas na nanungulan at nanunungulan halang-alang sa kapakanan ng mga Pilipino. Ramon Magsaysay Isa siya sa pinakahinahangahang naging presidente ng Pilipinas at binansagang mambo magsaysay. Ang kauna-unahang presidente na nanumpa suot ang barong Tagalog. Ang baryo to baryo na pangangampanya ni Magsaysay noong siya ay kumakandidato bilang presidente na mulat ang kanyang mga mata sa mga nakakaawang kalagayan ng mga Pilipinong nakatira sa mga probinsya, partikular na mga magsasaka na hindi pinansin ng mga nagdaang presidente sa kanyang pamumuno ay binigyan niya ng pagkakataon ang mga magsasaka na magmayari ng lupa ayon sa batas ng Land Reform Act of 1955. Nakapagbigay siya ng halos 23,578 hektare ng lupa sa mga karapat dapat na Pilipinong mabigyan ng lupa. Sa taong din yun, nasa 8,800 na mga pamilya ang nai-resettle ng National Resettlement and Rehabilitation Administration sa 22 Resettlement Project. Ito naman ang literal na itsura ng labas ng Malacanang matapos lamang ang halos dalawang araw mula ng mahalal si Magsaysay bilang Pangulo. Literal kasi niyang binuksan ang pintuan ng Malacanang sa karaniwang tao upang ipahayag ang kanilang mga hinain at sugiranin. Halos tatlong beses sa isang linggo kung makinig siya ng personal sa mga hinain ng mga taong bayan. Kusang sumuko sa kanya ang leader ng hukbalaha na si Luis Taru noong May 17, 1954. Bilang pagtupad sa kanyang pangako sa panahon ng kanyang pangangampanya, binuo niya ang Presidential Complaints and Action Committee na naatasang dominit sa mga hinain ng taong bayan at mga solusyonan nito sa lalong madaling panahon. Itinuturing ng kasaysayan na ang kanyang administrasyon bilang pinakamalinis na pamahalaan sa korupsyon. Sa katunayan, kinilala ang Pilipinas noon bilang second cleanest and well-governed country sa buong Asia at tinaguri ang Golden Years of the Philippines ang panahon ng kanyang pamumuno. Labi siyang tumutok sa pagpapalago ng sektor ng agraryo sa bansa. Binuo niya ang National Resettle and Rehabilitation and Administration na nagbigay ng lupa sa mga wala nito. Nilagdaan din niya ang Republic Act of 1199 na nagbigay ng seguridad sa trabaho sa mga magsasaka ng lupang hindi nila pagmamayari. Sa pamamagitan ng Republic Act No. 821 na itatag niya ang Agricultural Credit Cooperative Financing Administration na makapagpapahiram ng kinakailangang puhunan sa mga malilit na magsasaka. Sa halos apat na taong panunungkulan ni Magsaysay ay lumago ang ekonomiya ng Pilipinas at naramdaman ito ng buong sambayanan. Hindi gaya ng ibang politiko, ayaw na ayaw ni Magsaysay na ipangalan sa kanya ang mga lugar, tulay, plaza at kung ano-ano pa. Hindi siya nagnais na itrato siya ng espesyal dahil pantay-pantay lamang ang tingin niya sa bawat isa. Hindi mapagpangkap, hindi makasirili at walang interes sa pagpapayaman. Taglay lahat ni Ramon Magsaysay ang ideal politician na dapat meron tayo ngayon. Ferdinand Marcos Itunuturing si Marcos bilang pinakamatalinong naging pangulo ng Pilipinas, hindi lang dahil sa mga naging tagumpay nito sa akademya, kundi dahil sa naging taktika niya na kanyang ginamit upang ayusin ang bansang Pilipinas. Narito ang kanyang mga naging kontribusyon, Reforma sa Lupa. Ang reporma sa lupa ay tumutukoy sa legal na pagbili ng pamahalaan sa malawak na lupaing sakahan upang ipamahani sa mga magsasaka. Unang ipinatupad ang reporma sa lupa sa Pilipinas nang samsamin ni Emilio Aguinaldo ang lupain ng mga praile at ipinamahali sa mga magsasakang Pilipino. Ang layunin ng programa sa reporma ng lupa ay utusan ng lahat ng mga nagmamayari ng lupain na natatamdan ng bigas at mais na hatiin ang labis nilang lupa upang ibigay sa mga magsasakang walang lupa. Maaaring bayaran ng magsasaka ang kanyang lupaing naangking sa pamahalaan sa loob ng labing limang taon. Dito na din itinatag ni Ferdinand Marcos ang Department of Agrarian Reform, isang ahensya ng gobyerno na namamahala sa maayos at organisadong pamimigay ng lupa sa mga magsasakang Filipino. Green Revolution sa panahon ni Marcos, unang ipinakilala sa bansa ang isdang tilapia. Tinulungan niya ang lahat ng mamamayan sa kahit sa ang sulok ng bansa. Sa pamamagitan ng pamimigay ng libreng sibilya ng tilapia at paggawa ng mga fish pans upang mabilis itong maparami. Naging kabi-kabila din ang pagpapatayo ng mga aquatic research center na naging malaki ang tulong sa matagumpay na pagkakatuklas sa pagpaparami ng bangus. Nagawa ng bansa na makapag-breed ng bangus sa mga sea cages noong 1980. Ang tilapia at bangus ay mga patunay sa programang tinatamasa at napakikinabangan natin hanggang sa ngayon. Layunin ang programang infrastruktura na mabigyan ng patubig ang mga magsasaka at gumawa ng mga kalsada at tulay upang mas makabilis ang paglabas-paso ng produkto sa isang lugar, sa mga karating lugar at probinsya na malaki ang tulong sa ekonomiya ng buong bansa. 
Marami ang naipatayo ni Ferdinand Marcos sa kanyang panunukulan na hanggang sa kasalukuyan ay napakikinabangan. Tulad na lamang ng Saloni Kubrich na pangatlo sa pinakamahabang tulay sa Pilipinas. Pinagdurugtong nito ang Samar at ang Leyte. Proyekto din ni Marcos ang Maharlik Highway at Marcos Highway. Proyektong industrial. Sa panahon ng panunukulan ni Marcos ay pumangalawa sa bansang Japan ang Pilipinas bilang may pinakamagandang ekonomiya sa buong Asia. Hindi maaaring independe na lamang sa agrikulturang kabuhayan ng Pilipinas. Naisip ni Marcos na dadami pa ang populasyon sa hinaharap kaya mga kailangan pa ng mas maraming na pagkakataan. At bilang maging bansang industriyal ang Pilipinas sa hinaharap ay nagtayo siya ng mga export processing zone sa iba't ibang probinsya sa Pilipinas. Dito ay maaaring magtayo ng mga planta o pabrika mula sa iba't ibang kumpanya na makapagbibigay ng karagdagang trabaho para sa mga Pilipino. Siya din na nagpasimula ng no contractualization law at ng 13-month pay law. Sa programang pangagrikultura, binigyan ng gobyerno ang mga magsasaka ng technical at financial aid at ang iba ay insentibo tulad ng rice support. Inilunsad niya ang Masagana 99. Sa programang ito ay magtatanim ng palay sa tulong ng Rice Research Institute. Ang produksyon ng palay ay lumago dahil buka sa suportado ng gobyerno ang mga magsasaka ay ipinalaganap din ang pagtatanim ng IR-8 hybrid rice na mas hamak na maraming naaaning palay kaysa sa ibang binhi. Noong taong iyon ay naging exporter ng bigas ang Pilipinas pero sa kasalukuyan tayo ang nag import ng bigas mula sa ibang bansa na kung minsan ay may nakakapas pang illegal at smuggled na bigas mula sa ibang bansa. Blue Revolution Ang ilang mga seafoods tulad ng hipon, banak, bangus at tilapia ay ibinibenta sa mga may hirap sa mababang Halaga. Nagkaroon ng programa si Ferdinand Marcos na naglalayong ang mga mangingisda ay makakautang ng pera upang maging puhunan sa kanilang pangingisda. Bukod dito ay tinulungan din ni President Marcos ang mga mangingisda upang maibenta sa tama at sapat na presyo ang kanilang huli para mabilis din ang pagbabayad ng kanilang inuta. Kasama sa programa ang pagpapaunlad ng palaisdaan, sapat na produksyon, pagsasalata at pagpapalawak ng mga pamilihan. Proyektong Pang-Enerhiya Dahil sa krisis sa langis noong 1973, sinikat ng pamahalaan na tumuklas ng alternatibong mapagkukunan ng enerhiya. Maraming mga plantang pinagkukunan ng enerhiya ang naipatayo ni Marcos, gaya na lamang ng Bataan Nuclear Power Plant, Late Geothermal Power Plant, Makiling Banahaw Geothermal Power Plant at marami pang iba. Paglinang sa kulturang Pilipino. Layunin nito na makilala at ipakita ang sining ng kulturang Pilipino sa buong mundo. Ipinatayo ang Cultural Center of the Philippines at Folk Art Theater na ngayon ay tinatawag na Tanghalang Francisco Balagtas na pinangunahan ni dating First Lady Belda Marcos. At dito ginanap ang kaunaunahang Miss Universe noong taong 1974 sa Maynila. Rodrigo Roa Duterte Bilang kasalukuyang presidente ng Pilipinas, pasan-pasan ni Tatay Digo ang isa sa may tuturing na pinakamabigat na problema na kinakaharap hindi na lamang ng Pilipinas kundi ng buong mundo. Sa halos limang taong panunungkulan ni Duterte ay marami na rin siyang napatunayan na naging malaki ang ambag sa pag-umlan ng Pilipinas. Narito ang ilan sa kanyang mga nagawa. Pagbaba ng bilang ng may hirap mula 23.5%. Hanggang 16.7% dahil sa tatlong pangunahing reforma sa buwis. Ang Rice Tarification Law na nagtanggal sa monopolyo ng bigas at pagpayag sa pag-aangkat dahilan upang mapababa ang presyo ng bigas. Ang Trade o Tax Reform for Acceleration and Inclusion Law ng Enero 2018 na nagbibigay exemption mula sa income taxes para sa kumikita ng hindi hihigit sa 250,000 pesos kada taon. At ang Universal Care Act isang sosyalistang batas na kinopi ng mga bansa tulad ng Thailand ngunit nasisira ng malawak ang katiwalian sa Health Insurance Agency ng Pilipinas ang PhilHealth. Inisa-isa rin ng palasyo ang ilang mahalagang batas na naipasa ng Kongreso at nilagdaan ni Pangulong Duterte gaya ng free irrigation, free tuition sa 112 state universities and colleges, national mental health policy at national feeding program para sa mga undernourished school children. Pinasimula ng kampanya laban sa illegal na droga, inihayag sa latest report na nasa 115,435 drug operations na ang naisagawa at 164,265 drug personalities ang naaresto habang 9,503 na barangay ang naideklarang drug-free. Nagbigay ng parusa at banta sa mga abusadong korporasyon ng tubi, telecommunications at media. Pinagsikapan niyang tanggalin ang mga pangmata galang kontrata ng dalawang pangunahing water concessionaires sa Metro Manila at kalapit na mga probinsya. Ang Maynilad Water 
at ang Manila Water Corporation. Maliban kung tatanggap sila ng bagong kontrata na may mas mahusay na termino para sa gobyerno ng Pilipinas. Sa ilalim ni Duterte, nakamit ng Pilipinas ang pinakamataas na credit rating BBB Plus noong April 2020 sa kabila ng COVID-19. Noong June 2020, na-upgrade pa ng Japan Credit Rating Agency ang rating sa Pilipinas sa A-. Sinimulan ang Build, Build, Build Infrastructure Plan na ang makabulhang bahagi ng patakaran ay ang pagbuo ng mga infrastruktura at industriya. Kasama rin sa programa ang pagpapatuloy ng ilang mga proyekto na sinimulan ng nakaraang administrasyon ni Pangulong Benigno Aquino III. Mahigit sa isang taon pa ang natitira sa termino ni Duterte. Saan niya kaya ito gugugulin at ano-ano pa kaya ang kanyang magiging mga hakbang? Ngayon na nalaman nyo ang ilan sa mga nagawang kontribusyon ng tatlong presidente ito sapat pa itong dahilan upang sila ang maging pinakamauhusay na presidente ng Pilipinas. And one of the dangers is to have an inexperienced president taking over, believing that she can run the country when she cannot. The only issue in this election is Mr. Marcos himself and the 20 years of his misrule. Now look, I don't want to talk about this anymore. If you do, I'm going to walk out. I am ready to call a snap election. Nasulat dun sa isang kalye, Cory Aquino, isang bala ka lang. Hindi ako natatakot. Ang sagot ko dyan ay Ferdinand Marcos, isang balota ka lang. Sa mga kabataan na hindi mulat sa ating kasaysayan, marahil ay narinig nyo na ang tungkol sa snap election na naganap noong taong 1986. Malamang ang marami sa atin ay alam na kung bakit nagkaroon ng biglang eleksyon noong panahon ni Pangulong Ferdinand Marcos. Pero kung isa ka sa mga hindi pa ito nalalaman ng lubusan, halina't samahan niyo akong alamin ang tunay na kwento sa pagkakaroon ng snap election sa Pilipinas noong panahon ni Pangulong Ferdinand Marcos. Isa umano sa pinakamadumi at pinakamarahas na eleksyon sa bansa ang snap presidential election ni dating Pangulong Ferdinand Marcos noong taong 1986. Hindi na raw matiis ng mga mamamayan, mahirap man o mayaman kaya't lumaban na maging maituturing ng mga elit. Kasama ang iba pa niyang mga kaibigang negosyante, itinatag ni Jose Concepcion o mas kilala sa pangalang Jokon ang NAMFREL o National Citizens Movement for Free Elections. Ito ang inaasahang magbabantay umano sa eleksyon. At res ng Nobyembre taong 1985, dahil sa mga paratang, nawala ng tiwalang mga Pilipino noon kay Pangulong Ferdinand Marcos at dahil dito ay nagpatawag siya ng biglang eleksyon. I am ready to call a snap election perhaps earlier than 8 months, perhaps in 3 months or... Inihayag ni Pangulong Ferdinand Marcos ang pagdaraos ng snap election sa visa ng Republic Act No. 883 ng regular na batasang pambansa. Sinasabi din na isa ito sa kondisyon ng International Military Fund bago muling makautang ang Pilipinas. Nais munang masiguro ng IMF na matatag ang gobyerno ng Pilipinas at mangyayari lamang ito kung magkakaroon ng halalan. Tumakbong muli si Ferdinand Marcos bilang Pangulo at si Arturo Tolentino sa pagkapangalawang Pangulo sa ilalim ng Partidong Kilos ang Bagong Lipunan o KBL. Samantalang sa kanilang oposisyon mula sa Partidong Laban ay tumatakbo naman si Corazon Aquino bilang Pangulo. Habang kinausap naman ni Cardinal Singh, si Salvador o Doy Laurel na maging running mate ni Cory bilang vice presidente nang sa ganoy mas maging malakas ang kanilang partido na sinunod naman ni Doy. Noong ikapito ng Pebrero taong 1986, naganap ang biglang eleksyon o snap eleksyon na kung saan si Pangulong Ferdinand Marcos sa ilalim ng partidong kilos ang bagong lipunan ay lubos na umaasang siya'y muling mananalo dahil ilang beses na niyang napatunayan ang suporta sa kanya ng mga mamamayan. Ang kalaban noon ni Marcos ay si Cory Aquino na hindi niya inaasahang papasok siya sa politika mula sa pagiging simpleng may bahay lamang. Marami noon ang sumuporta kay Aquino dahil ang taong bayan ay naniniwalang siya ang karapat dapat na kandidatong may pangtatapat na panlaban kay Pangulong Ferdinand Marcos. 
Una nang inihayag noon ni Cory na tatakbo lamang siya kung makakalikom ng isang milyong pirma mula sa taong bayan at kung magpapatawang ng snap election si Pangulong Ferdinand Marcos. Una nang naghayag na magkakaroon ng snap election si Marcos. Ngayon ay kailangan na lamang ni Cory na makakalap ng isang milyong pirma o lagda para matuloy ang kanyang pagtakbo. Sa pamamagitan ng isang milyong lagda na kinalap ng Corazon Aquino for President Movement o CAPTEM na pinamumunuan ni Joaquin Chino Roses mula sa Manila Times, si Cory ay napapayag din sa wakas na kalabanin si Ferdinand Marcos. Sa araw mismo ng botohan, marami ang hindi nakaboto. Nagkandawalaan umano ang maraming pangalan ng mga butante sa mga listahan. Nagkaroon din ng mga kaso ng pagbili ng boto sa halagang 50 piso at agawan ng mga balota. Sa pagbibilang ng boto, magkatulad na klase ng computer ang ginamit ng magkabilang panig para sa bilangan. Subalit ang nakapagtataka ay magkaibang lumalabas na resulta ng bilang at hindi nagtutugma sa isa't isa. Sa bilangan mula sa Commission on Election o COMELEC, nangunguna si Pangulong Ferdinand Marcos. Subalit sa Namfrel, ipinapakitang nangunguna si Corazon Aquino. Dahil sa labis na kaguluhan na nangyayari, napagdesisyonan na batas ang pambansa na lamang ang magpapatuloy ng bilangan. Dahil na rin sa ang mga nagbibilang sa Comelec sa panguna ni Linda Kapunan ay huminto na sa pagbibilang dahil umano hindi na nila kayang tanggapin ang talamak na dayaan. Sa opisyal na bilang ng batas ang pambansa, Malinaw na lumalabas na sina Ferdinand Marcos at Arturo Tolentino ang nanalo subalit hindi ito kinilala at tinanggap ng kanilang oposisyon. Dahil sa resultang ito, hinikayat ni Cory Aquino ang mga mamamayang Pilipino na magsagawa ng protesta. Isang kampanya na di pagsunod o civil disobedience ang inilunsad ni Cory Aquino upang mapaalis sa palasyo ang pamilya Marcos. Ang eleksyon na ito ay isa sa maituturing na pinakakontrobersyal sa bansa na may malawakan at lantaran o manong dayaan na naganap. Makikita sa video ang pag-walk out ng may tatlong pong tabulators sa pangunguna ni Mirna Binamira na isang computer technician mula sa bilang ng batas ang pambansa. Si Ferdinand Marcos ang siyang tunay na nanalo. Ayon sa kanilang huling bilang, lamang si Marcos ng halos 1.5 milyong boto kay Cory Aquino dahil dito muling ipinroklama si Ferdinand Marcos bilang bagong halal na pangulo habang pangalawang pangulo naman si Arturo Tolentino. Sa panahon ng bilangan ay pinahintulutang lumahok ang NAMFREL o National Movement for Election ang kanilang himpilan ay nasa Lasal, Green Hills. At naniniwala ang grupong ito na si Cory Aquino ang inihalal na bagong pangulo ng Pilipinas. Dahil sa kanilang paninindigan, Naganap ang makasaysayang People Power Ed sa Revolution na bumago sa kasaysayan ng Pilipinas. Ilang araw lamang matapos ang eleksyon ay naganap ang 1986 People Power Revolution. Ito'y bunga ng pagmimithi ng mga mamamayang magkaroon ng pagbabago sa bansa at para makamit nila ang tinatawag nilang demokrasya. Naniniwalang planado umano talaga ni Cory Aquino na makipagsabwatan sa mga Amerikano upang mapatalsik si Pangulong Ferdinand Marcos. According sa isang declassified CIA file na kinuha nila sa Washington Post, his ex-CIA agent recalls Marcos's rise to power. Noong 1951, itinatag ng CIA o Central Intelligence Agency ang NAMFREL, the National Movement for Free Elections, para ihalal at maipwesto si Magsaysay noong 1953. Hindi lang yan, umamin na itong CIA na nagbibigay sa $50,000 kay Makapagal para magbigay ng political information sa CIA. Sabi ng Executive Intelligence Review, the economic hitmen, Schultz and the hitmen destroyed the Philippines by Mike Billington. Simula 1972 hanggang 1981 kung saan uh, ito yung period ng martial law, umunlad ang uh, ekonomiya ng Pilipinas. Dumami ang kalsada, maraming nagkakuryente, maraming nagkaroon ng irrigation, at tayo naging independent sa rice and corn. Idagdag nyo pa dyan yung independence o economic independence sa ibibigay kapag naitatag at nabuksan ang bataan nuclear power plant. At yung ganyang klase daw ng development ay hindi matotolerate ng International Monetary Fund at World Bank. Dahil ang gusto ng mga Amerikano noon ay kontrolin ang ekonomiya ng Pilipinas. Paano ko nasabi yan? Dahil dito sa isang declassified CIA file noong 1984. Papakita ko sa inyo isang parte dyan. Maikita nyo dito sa NSSD US Policy Towards the Philippines Executive Summary 
The problem, ang pinakailalim, maliban sa communist insurgency, isa pang problema ng Amerika sa Pilipinas, ay hindi sila nagbe-benefit sa isang strong investment and trade position. Kailangan sila ang bida. Dahil dyan, nagpalit sila ng policy to an act Activist Policy Response, anong ibig sabihin yan? Ibig sabihin, sinuportahan nilang oposisyon sa pamamag oposisyon, mga dilawan ng mga panahon na yon sa pamamagitan ng um, sinuportahan nila yung moderate reforms or change at uh, influence positive decisions and movement on such issues as the new presidential succession formula, a credible investigation of the Aquino assassination and Institution rebuilding through unacceptable parliamentary elections. Lahat ng po ito ay nangyari. Pero hindi lahat ay nagka, nagkaroon ng bunga. At isinama nila sa kanilang short to medium term goals. Institutional change in preparation for the 1986 local election and the 1987 presidential elections. Ibig sabihin mga kaibigan, pinlano na ng CIA na pakailaman ang 1986 elections. Shorts and the Hitmen destroyed the Philippines by Mike Billington Editor's Note. This is the third in a series of features on the assault against the third world by the economic Hitmen. We examine here first the case of the Philippines. And then Mexico. The U.S. orchestrated coup which overthrew the government of Philippines President Ferdinand Marcos in 1986 was a classic case study of what John Perkins describes in his recent book, Confessions of an Economic Hit Man, as the post-World War II preferred method of imposing colonial control under another name. In the Philippines case, George Schultz performed the roles of both the economic hit man, destroying and taking full control of the Philippine economy, and the coup master, deposing the Philippine president in favor of an IMF puppet, while calling the operation, People Power. Throughout this process, from the late 1970s through the February 1986 coup and beyond, Lyndon LaRouche and his collaborators were fully engaged in the fight to expose and reverse this subversion and destruction of one of America's most important allies by the supranational financial institutions which Schultz and his ilk represent, by mobilizing support from patriots of both the United States and the Philippines. The LaRouche effort put a spotlight on the crimes of the Schultz cabal. As will be shown below. Although the effort failed to stop the process at that time, the crimes thus exposed in the Philippines can and must serve today as a nemesis to Schultz and his neoconservative operatives, who are in an endgame in their effort to impose a new fascist order over the planet. In a November 16 interview on radio station DZAR in Manila, LaRouche described his own view of the special mission of the Philippines nation. The Philippines has a very important pivotal role, some people would say geopolitically, in the entire region, of trying to bring together on a global scale for the first time a world system, which is capable of accommodating both the European cultural heritage and Asian cultures. This is the great barrier, the great frontier of a hopeful future for this planet. To bring together the cultures of Asia, which are different than those of Western Europe generally, with European culture. To get a global culture based on a system of sovereign nation-states, which understands that this unresolved cultural question has to be addressed, with a long-term view, of several generations, of creating an integrated set of sovereign nation-states as the system of the planet. So the Philippines is a very special country, with a unique importance for the people of Asia, in particular, in playing a key role in bringing about this kind of general integration of Asian and European civilizations. The lesson of the subversion of the Philippines in the 1980s for today is clear. Schultz is the eminent scree behind the neoconservatives running the Bush administration, which has brought the world to the current disastrous circumstance. It is also the case that the Philippines, although currently lacking any national leadership comparable to that of Marcos, is nonetheless facing a new coup threat, orchestrated by the same neoconservative circles in Washington who were responsible for the 1986 coup. The popular memory of Ferdinand Marcos today, in the U.S. and in the Philippines, 
is largely shaped by the massive disinformation campaign created in the early 1980s by the circles around then Secretary of State Schultz and his deputy Paul Wolfowitz. Marcos was accused of corruption, human rights violations, plunder, and even the murder of a political opponent. Benigno Aquino, and this caricature is repeated ad nauseum still today. While Marcos was not without faults, he was by far the last Filipino head of state to have understood the challenge of true leadership in a world slipping towards chaos. His overthrow by the Schultz cabal had nothing to do with the charges issued publicly, but were intended to stop his national development policies and his international collaboration with LaRouche and others in countering the genocidal policies of the IMF and bringing into being a new world economic system based on development and justice. Marcos's true legacy Marcos was elected president in 1965, just as the United States launched the disastrous and futile war in Indochina. The fact that the United States used its bases in the Philippines Subic Bay and Clark Airfield in Luzon, as launching pads for the Indochina War, fed a domestic insurgency by the Maoist New People's Army NPA. Marcos was then treated as a close friend and ally of the United States. Even when he declared martial law in 1972, with the Indochina War still raging, the administration of President Richard Nixon raised no objections. But Marcos was not only concerned about counterinsurgency in declaring martial law. When he was elected president in 1965, the Philippines was still essentially a colonial economy. Although the United States had granted full independence on July 4, 1946, as had been promised by President Franklin Roosevelt in 1934, productivity was low in both agriculture and industry. Agriculture lagged as the Philippines relied on special access to U.S. food exports, and industry was confined to process industries, rather than the development of basic industries. Marcos set out immediately to establish Philippine food self-sufficiency in rice and corn. This also required breaking the control of the landed aristocracy left over from the Spanish imperial era. Marcos was the first president of the Philippines who did not rise from this elite class, but was a commoner, trained as a lawyer. As president, he focused on basic agricultural infrastructure, especially irrigation, in the major food-producing regions of Luzon and Mindanao, credit facilities, mechanization, and the introduction of high-yield rice varieties, which needed irrigation resulted in the elimination of rice imports by 1968. Land reform, primarily a political problem, remained elusive. However, when Marcos imposed martial law in 1972, among his first acts was a proclamation that the entire nation was to be considered a land reform area, and a declaration that all tenants working land devoted primarily to rice and corn were to be the owners of that land up to a specified limit. Despite the enraged opposition of the oligarchy, the program proved to be extraordinarily successful. Coupled with the infrastructure and mechanization improvements, a quarter of a million peasants became landowners, and grain productivity increased by half. Another major step after the declaration of martial law was to contract with Westinghouse for the Bataan nuclear power plant, which was to be the first, and would still be the only, commercial nuclear power plant in Southeast Asia. While nuclear power is clearly the only sane solution to the energy requirements across the region, the sad saga of the Bataan nuclear plant symbolizes the pure evil of the policies enforced by the economic hitmen. As originally contracted, the plant should have cost about $1 billion, and produced one. 200 megawatts of electricity by 1984. However, after the hysteria generated by the anti-nuclear nuclear club of Wall Street, Air. Deck. 3. 2004, following the 1979 accident at the Three Mile Island nuclear plant in Pennsylvania, the Carter administration imposed retroactive safety regulations which contributed to more than doubling the cost of construction. Then, 
after the overthrow of Marcos in 1986. One of the first acts of the new presidency of Corazon Aquino was to mothball the fully completed, but never used, Bataan nuclear plant. The Philippines has been forced to pay countless billions in debt service and pays still today over $155.000 per day for this nuclear facility without having drawn one watt of electricity from the state-of-the-art facility. Two further nuclear power facilities which were planned to provide 1.880 megawatts of electricity by 1991 were also scrapped. Nuclear energy was not the only innovation of the Marcos regime. In 1979 Marcos announced a plan for 11 major industrial projects with the intention of shifting the focus of the nation's industrial economy from consumer goods to basic heavy industry. Included in the plan were steel, petrochemical, pulp and paper, a copper smelter, aluminum, phosphate fertilizer, diesel engines, gas and oil, a coconut industry, and the nuclear power program. The Marcos administration, during the 1972-81 martial law period, tripled the country's road network, doubled the electrification of the country's homes, increased irrigated cropland eightfold, and achieved rice and corn self-sufficiency. Minimum daily wage rates tripled. Although inflation, driven by international oil price hikes and exploding U.S. interest rates, more than wiped out these wage increases. Enter the economic hit men this level of development, especially the capacity to free the nation from dependence on the international oil and raw materials cartels, was not to be tolerated by the international financial institutions. The contrived oil shortages of the 1970s left the Philippines, like all non-oil producing nations, with huge debts. This was followed by the 20% plus interest rates imposed by U. S. Federal Reserve Board Chairman Paul Volcker in 1979, which doubled and tripled the debts of most third world nations within a few years. In 1981, Marcos lifted martial law. Also in that year, he attended the North-South Summit in Cancun, Mexico, organized by Mexican President José López Portillo, see accompanying article, where he spoke out for a new world economic order and denounced the destructive conditionalities imposed by the IMF in exchange for financial assistance in a crisis. Then, in September 1981, Marcos pushed through the Philippine Congress nearly $4 billion worth of priority infrastructure projects, including irrigation, drainage and flood control programs, highways, telecommunications, and airports. This was answered in 1982, the year George Schultz became Secretary of State, by an IMF report which attacked Marcos's projects, demanding debt payment instead. In the Philippines situation, restraint on public investment could be an effective instrument for securing an improvement in the current account deficit. IMF Director Jacques Delarosière lectured that the country had set unrealistic growth targets while the World Bank denounced the Marcos government for supporting national industries. These, softening up, raids were not adequate to control the Marcos government. Schultz visited Manila in the summer of 1983, overseeing another 20% devaluation of the Philippine peso, thus further increasing the costs of financing the already illegitimate foreign debt. The full-scale assault began in the fall of 1983, with the murder of Benigno Aquino. Aquino, an opposition leader whom Marcos had allowed to leave prison in order to get medical treatment in the United States, despite facing a death sentence for murder and subversion, chose to return to the Philippines in August 1983 after three years in the United States. He was gunned down as he emerged from his plane in Manila. Although the actual conspirators were never officially discovered, the assassination was immediately blamed on Marcos. And the economic hitmen called in the jackals, as Perkins called those whose job was to depose or even kill world leaders who resisted the demands of the economic hitmen like himself. In the Philippines, 
Schultz and Wolfowitz doubled as economic hitmen and jackals. As to Aquino's view of the pending threat to his life, he had been asked by the U.S. magazine Mother Jones in January 1983, while contemplating his return to the Philippines. What do you think Marcos will do? Aquino replied. He will keep me alive. Because he knows the moment I die. I am a martyr. Like Martin Luther King. And he wouldn't want that. Another possibility. He lets me out. And the communists knock me off. They blame Marcos. They have a martyr and they have eliminated a stumbling block. Aquino also understood the actual cause of the economic disaster striking the Philippines. If you made me president of the Philippines today, my friend, in six months I would be smelling like horse shit. Because there is nothing I can do. I cannot provide employment. I cannot bring prices down. Within two months of the assassination, the remaining credit lines to the Philippines were drastically cut and another 21% devaluation was imposed. The nation was bankrupt. Finally, on October 15, 1983, Marcos was allowed to declare a moratorium on the unpayable debt, but only on condition that the big projects he had backed to modernize the nation be scrapped. While many of the industries supported by the state were turned over to domestic and international vultures, this was done under the guise of accusing the owners of these industries of being corrupt cronies of Marcos. The La Rouge movement, meanwhile, was sponsoring conferences in Bangkok, Thailand, one in October 1983, and another in October 1984, on the subject of the proposal authored by Lyndon La Rouge for development of the Pacific and Indian Ocean basins. Philippines Deputy Foreign Minister Pacifico Castro attended the 1984 conference, speaking on regional economic cooperation and security. Joined by government and business leaders from across the region, the conferences proposed such great projects as the Kra Canal in Thailand and the physical transformation of Asia as the driving force behind a new world economic order. Jackals the opponents of Marcos were soon being wined and dined in Washington by both the right-wing, Schultz and Wolfowitz, and the left-wing, Rep. Stephen Siletz, Sen. Ted Kennedy, and Princeton's Richard Falk, of the Project Democracy apparatus, which performed the subversive tasks assigned by the Sinecist banking institutions. Salvador Laurel, the son of the Quisling president of the Philippines under the Japanese occupation, headed the opposition after Aquino's assassination, and in February 1984, visited Washington, where he was greeted by Vice President George H. W. Bush and Secretary of State Schultz. Representative Siletz introduced legislation into the Congress to abdicate the treaty regulating the U.S. bases in the Philippines, cutting the agreed aid to the Philippines by two-thirds. At the same time, a nest of anti-nuclear and anti-development NGOs in the United States took up the cause of overthrowing the Marcos dictatorship, including a gathering of anti-nuclear forces in Manila, including Richard Falk and representatives of the West German Green Party. Stephen Bosworth, a close collaborator of Henry Kissinger, was appointed ambassador to the Philippines, and from that position he would subsequently orchestrate the coup against Marcos. By October 1984, the Philippines was forced to submit to an IMF refinancing package that included an end to price controls on rice and other staples. A float of the peso. Unrestricted foreign exchange speculation. Import reductions. Domestic austerity. And yet another devaluation, making a total of a 63.3% devaluation in one year nearly doubling the cost of financing the foreign debt. Ironically, the opposition, fully supported and sponsored by the IMF-related institutions, rallied support among the population by denouncing Marcos for acceding to the oppressive conditions of the IMF. Throughout 1985, President Ronald Reagan defended the American relationship with the Philippines and with President Marcos. Despite the fact that Secretary of State Schultz and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz openly disagreed with that assessment, 
instead demanding Marcos's head. The crisis came to a head in July 1984, when the U.S. Congress adopted the Salet's proposal to rip up the bases agreement, not only slashing the financial commitments, but insisting that the remaining aid be distributed not by the Philippine government, but by the church, which, under Cardinal Jamie Sin, had openly called for insurrection against the government. By November, the plans for insurrection were unveiled publicly. As the Washington-based Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, the home of Henry Kissinger and Zbigniew Brzezinski, carried out a war game against the Philippines. Based on a scenario in which President Marcos is assassinated, Soviet Spetsnaz commandos join the new People's Army in taking over the Philippines. And the U.S. military goes into action to save the country. The CSIS's work in Asia was largely financed at that time by the C. B. Star Insurance Empire, run by Morris Hank Greenberg. Greenberg and C. B. Star owned most of the insurance industry in the Philippines and a number of Philippine politicians as well, and served as the crucial, on the ground, economic hit man in the Marcos coup. Marcos continued fighting for the principle of a new world economic order. In November 1985, Air and the Schiller Institute, the international association directed by Lyndon and Helga LaRouche, invited Gen. Edgardo Mercado Jaron, Ret. Closing parenthesis comma the head of Peru's Institute of Geostrategic and Political Studies, to tour Asia, promoting the partial moratorium on foreign debt then being implemented by the Peruvian government. In addition to conferences in Thailand and India, General Mercado Jaron and the Air Schiller Institute delegation met with President Marcos in Manila. Marcos told the delegation, Third World Asian and South American countries should get together and push through the condonation of part of their loans. How can third world countries pay their loans? Amounting to $900 billion. Marcos estimated that the paying capacity could not exceed $300 billion. The August 16 Air published a story entitled, Plotting the Fall of an American Ally, which reported that U.S. Ambassador Bosworth was plotting a military coup against the Marcos government. The article reported, Bosworth now meets up to two hours every day with acting chief of staff Lieutenant Gen. Fidel Ramos, a West Point graduate whom the United States is attempting to groom as a leader of a new civilian military junta. Despite his loyalty to President Marcos, The story was based on information from reliable sources both in the Philippines and in Washington, where certain patriotic layers within the government, intelligence, and the military did not accept America's transformation into an imperial power serving the cynicist financial interests. The air expose forced a public denial by General Ramos and by Ambassador Bosworth. As events proved, the warning was deadly accurate. Marcos was finally coerced by Washington into calling new elections for February 1986. Even though the Constitution mandated elections only in 1987, the opposition, in constant coordination with U.S. Ambassador Bosworth and the Schultz State Department, chose to run Aquino's widow, Corazon Aquino, as the presidential candidate, with Laurel for vice president as still seen today in such neocon control, people's power revolutions, such as in Georgia and Ukraine. U.S. intelligence agencies financed and controlled that citizen electoral monitor organization, the National Movement for a Free Election, NAMFREL, and prepared to declare vote fraud if the election did not go the way intended. Paul Wolfowitz in November 1985 told the U.S. Congress that there would be a complete collapse of political confidence if the elections were not perceived as fair, i.e. if Marcos were not defeated. Indeed, on election day, the opposition was ahead in the early returns from Manila, which was expected, and Aquino was instructed to declare herself the winner. However, when the rural votes came in, where Marcos was still loved for the development he had brought to the nation, 
Marcos overtook Aquino and won the election. In an astonishing public admission. Former U.S. Ambassador to the Philippines William Sullivan, who had also been ambassador to Iran when the Shah was overthrown by similar means in 1979. Told CBS News on Feb. 9. Two days after the Philippines election. The facts as they emerge are becoming increasingly irrelevant. Because it's the perception that prevails both in the Philippines and, I think, internationally, that misses. Aquino won the election as far as the polling places were concerned. But the government, in the tabulation, changed the vote counts. As Air had warned, General Ramos then led a military revolt against President Marcos, calling for crowds to surround the military base in the center of Manila to create an image of people's power, while the masses of the population were disenfranchised by the overthrow of their elected president. By the end of February, President Reagan had been convinced by Schultz to give up his defense of President Marcos and endorse the military coup. Marcos and his family were sent to Hawaii. IMF carnage The results of this subversion are still evident today in the decay of the economic and social fabric of the Philippines. Corazon Aquino fulfilled every IMF request. From the closure of the completed nuclear power facility to the deregulation and privatization of much of the economy. It was a surprise to some of Aquino's supporters. But not to LaRouche. When the pro-IMF members of the Marcos cabinet were retained in the new government. General Ramos took over directly in the next presidential election in 1992. Selling the nation to the Enrons of the West through corrupt. Unequal contract agreements especially in the energy sector, which left the country in absolute bankruptcy after the speculative assault on the Asian economies in 1997-98. Joseph Estrada, another commoner, was elected president in 1998, but was allowed only two years in office before another economic hitman orchestrated coup again with General Ramos doing the bidding for his foreign controllers brought him down in January 2001. The current president, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, has generally done what was demanded of her by the neoconservatives in power in Washington. However, when she pulled the token Philippine military force out of Iraq, and then upgraded the country's relations with China, she won the ire of her patrons, and is now facing the threat of yet another coup, with General Ramos again the neocons man on the scene. Le Rouge together with his collaborators in the Philippines, intends to use this history of the economic hit men in the Philippines and elsewhere as a necessary part of the fight to end such criminality forever. As LaRouche concluded in his address to the November 16 radio show quoted above, I have had a long-standing special attachment to the Philippines, and I am very much concerned for its integrity and sovereignty and well-being today. I would be very happy. And the Philippines would make me very happy. By being truly sovereign, successful, growing, and peaceful again today. And you may expect that wherever I am and whatever I am doing, that commitment is very active within me. For very special reasons that I won't bother going into. On this question of the Philippines. I am concerned. The sovereignty of the Philippines and the success of the Philippines as a sovereign presidential republic is, to me, one of the necessary ingredients of a future for the whole Pacific area of the world.